Within three weeks, our numbers improved by at least 25%. I think we signed up 200 cases in September, and then October we got to just above 300 cases. Where do we find intakers? So there's no one particular source for us. We typically like to take, for this particular law firm, we like taking the easy route. We don't have time to go on Upwork and go through that route. So we just basically just use LegalSoft. LegalSoft, we basically order intakers like we're ordering off a menu. We need three intakers and then they just bring it to us. The question is, is it worth interviewing intakers? And if so, what questions do you ask and what do you look for? What questions to ask an intaker? Well, first, it depends if you need them to be bilingual. That's like a first check. The next thing I look for is some sort of salesmanship. People that have previously worked at like Bank Teller or at like a phone company where they have to do some sort of selling are always like really nice ones to get onto an intake team. Obviously, anybody who's had previous like intake experience are, are also good. And then just like some some accountability. They need to show up on time. They need to be on the phones, they need to be on top of things. The worst intaker you can have is just somebody who's a really smooth talker, but is making 10 calls a day because then you're not maximizing productivity. And you're going to, if you have a team of intakers, uh, you'll lower their morale by having one quote unquote slacker. So the sales experience, I think is crucial, right? How many years, whether they're actually doers. So it's very quickly, we can see, uh, we should be able to see how many calls that they're making. And usually the way they act in the first week is really exactly how they're going to be acting for a while. So quick decisions based on like good or bad. And then we started doing a score system. Do you mind sharing about that? Because that's something that I didn't do. And then until you brought it to us on a quality control and scoring system. Yeah. So you've got to have, obviously you need to have your defined KPIs for an intake department. Um, and then one other thing that you need to be listening or somebody needs to be listening to the actual calls. Uh, what we did was we set up a five criteria scoring system, one out of five for each of the different criteria. And then we have a quality control person that I've been working with to listen to calls, listen to a sampling of calls, and then score each of the intake agents. I think we have about 35 intake agents. So she goes through and she scores about 20 to 30 calls a day. And then we can very easily see at the end of a month, like if 20 of an individual's calls have been scored, what's their average score? We can look at how many people they signed up versus what their score quality is. The lower scores with the lower signups, they're probably not going to work out. And then it's also super helpful to identify where to improve intakers. Maybe somebody's got like a really low score for tone and empathy uh, that can be improved, or uh, somebody's got a really low score for filling out our CRM correctly. That's something that can just easily be addressed. We can also talk about incentives. Let's talk about that because that's a big one. So just to get out of the way, every intaker and every manager needs to have an incentive. So let's just get that out of the way. All right, there is no like particular number that is will be universal for anybody or anything just so it really doesn't matter just the fact that you do it with some kind of cadence but uh, the way that we do it when you could talk about this is the tiered system the way we kind of have you want to talk about it like the group incentive yeah. with some individual requirements so the way we have our intake team broken out they're broken out into a couple different teams and some of those teams have different levels of seniority so the way our incentive system works is there's an individual incentive and a team incentive. So if an individual hits their goal, they get their payout at the end of the month. If the team hits their goal, the whole team gets the payout at the end of the month. And if you hit your individual and team goal, you get both payouts. So it's a double incentive. The individual is always pushing to get the most signups they possibly can. And they're also working with their team. They have a teamwork aspect to get. So say where that comes into play, say somebody knows they're not gonna get their monthly bonus or their weekly bonus or whatever. They're still gonna try to sign up that extra one, two people so the team can get the bonus. You wanna have a double-sided incentive system so that people are always incentivized to continue to push. There is no such thing as too much incentive. Because ultimately you know, everybody's benefiting. So don't overthink the amount, just the fact that you have it. It's crucial. Ellen asked about the scoring criteria. Can you do you mind sharing the scoring criteria with everybody? And I'll try to type it out in the chat and share it with everybody. And James is also asking, did you create your own videos and scripts? Yes. Yeah. We, I created the script and then some of the easy ways to create videos is just to record yourself on zoom, doing a training or, or going through a script, but you can also use tools like loom to, to create your videos. By the time you joined, we had multiple uh, scripts and multiple things. 
from that you were in you had to consolidate and kind of clean it up what was the final product and what makes a better script is it a more thorough set of questions is it more straight to the point how much do you try to build the relationship in the thing like what are those big picture kind of things you try to include in the scripts good script you want to jump into the qualification as quickly as possible you obviously want to have the the sympathy with what the client is going through jump through the qualifications if somebody qualifies or could qualify in the future then you want to do the educational portion is what i call it you want to explain what your firm offers the law that you're practicing in and then you know, once you do that explanation you have a good you, you have some rapport you have some authority with the client if they can sign up on that call then you go and talk about the retainer agreement you want to have somebody explain the retainer agreement typically like the most the frequently asked questions on the retainer agreement like how are you getting paid like what does the client get out of it like essentially all the the financial pieces you want to have that explained and and then you want to send them the agreement while they're on the phone with you so they can look at it with you and they're much more likely to sign if they're looking at the agreement while you're explaining it yeah and then hopefully they sign or if they're not going to sign they need to go talk to somebody else talk to them about okay hey you need two days to consider this with with your partner or you want your friend that's an attorney to take a look at it okay you're going to have that done by tuesday i'll call you tuesday afternoon and we'll talk about it again if you haven't signed so you want to you, you don't want to just leave it an open-ended question if they're not going to sign on the call you need to establish with them when you're going to follow up to make sure they've signed what's the commonality amongst the top best integers certain personalities certain traits is there anything you've noticed they want to they want to get their signups and they want to make their money that's that that's that's what makes the, the best intaker somebody who's hungry somebody who understands the law enough to be able to sign somebody up and answer questions uh, but the hungry ones are going to figure that out and they're going to call they're going to they're not going to leave any stone unturned so i would look for somebody who's hungry and and has that internal motivation is there any triggers or anything any signs that they're hungry Thing that stands out i mean i guess from when you're interviewing them it's a little bit tougher it's just how they act that first week that first month do they want to learn everything they possibly can are they proactively asking questions the people that ask more questions typically end up being the hungrier ones and then you can if you have a solid set of kpis that you're tracking uh, you can just tell based on their performance who's the hungriest they're making the most calls they're looking for more leads to call they're frequently coming to you to to ask like hey could you do this for marketing could you do that for marketing i want to get more leads like you can easily tell based off how they act and how and what questions they're asking how hungry they are so intake collects the information qualifies the lead right i do criminal defense so the intake answers the call qualifies the lead then the schedules the consultation paid consultation i do consultation okay then after consultation the 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 prospect asks okay how much how much is your retainer okay now i want that part to be okay great question now you are going back to jane doe who who is our who you already spoke with and she's going to explain you the retainer and got it okay so you have three steps basically you have the initial screening you have the attorney consultation and then you have the close essentially right i mean i think the best uh are you are you is the initial screening happening and immediately you're talking to them like while the intake agent is like on hold or something or are they scheduling an appointment with you they are scheduling they're scheduling yeah. what i would do in that circumstance then is if you're scheduling an appointment just have that intake agent ready to go and just trans like do a call transfer directly to the intake agent after you're done with your consultation that would be so that they could close the deal that would be my recommendation for your for your circumstance. So I do the consultation and then the call gets transferred back to the intake. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm afraid and that's that's a mindset that I'm fighting with. I still can't okay, I until yesterday, I could not believe and agree with the fact that a non-attorney can close, can sell a retainer to a 
criminal defense client without that person speaking to the attorney first. That's my mindset. I know that a lot of attorneys do it. I know that it's internal, it's me. Now, that being said, and that now I can go to my second question. So yesterday I interviewed actually a guy who is like, he's he's so good that it's it's he's too good to be true this type of a guy and i role played with him he did sales for criminal defense firms he knows his shit he knows what he's doing now he can close he can sell anything dead horse he can do it the problem is how do i control him if I offer him the, the job, second, how do I pay him? Because he wants commission, right? And the commission, I have to be, we are in California. He His offer is, offer me subjective commission. Whatever you feel it's right based on the amount of sales I close and the amount of money I generate for your firm. That's his offer. It sounds great, but I don't like the subjective part of it because subjective is subjective is subjective. And first, it can be good for me, not good for him. But also, I don't know if that's an issue with state bar. So I know that he will be able to close. I mean, that's going to be taking care of the first part, which is my mindset. He is, he is asking for commission based, he says, it, it's subjective. Whatever you decide. So let's say I bring you, not bring you, I close, you bring the cases. Obviously, the cases are coming from me. But I close, let's say, 200000 this month. Then you decide how much commission, not not commission, how much bonus you want to give me. Do you have like an expected amount of cases you want to sign up a month? Uh, right now I don't because, well, right now I have three to five cases a month, but I started Legal Panel and I am, we starting, we just started our ad. I don't know what to expect. I don't know how many calls are going to come in. So I have no idea right now about the numbers. So you have three to five a month. Where do you want to be? 10 a month, 20 a month? I mean, 10, 10 a month would be an amazing jump. Yes. So why don't you do some sort of tiered system where at eight a month, he gets X amount of money at 10 a month, he gets X amount of money. And at 12 a month, he in a month, he gets X amount of money. You work out what that X is, but he needs to hit those performance targets to get his bonus. So um, if you want 10, you should have one level below that with a lower monetary amount. And then that, that 10 right in the middle, and then something higher than that to keep him pushing in case he has a big month. So I can't tell you how much to pay the guy, but yeah, would... you can have 10 cases, let's say eight cases and eight cases for hundred thousand dollars. And you can have eight cases for 300,000. If he's going to get the same amount of money, regardless of how much I generate, then I don't think he is. That's that's exactly what he doesn't want. Yeah, well, you can't do something that's not right because we can't do that. And I would not suggest it at all. So, so percentage, I know that you can't pay percentage. That's I, I get that. But we are not talking about percentage. We're talking about bonus based on the business generated. It's, it's a gray area. It's a gray area. But I think if you want to be safe, I would do it based on what is it? 8, 10, 15. Uh, sounds good. You have no idea how it's going to go. You have no idea how he is. Don't get your hopes up on this guy. We've heard both me and Iman in our experience have heard so many promises, so many things. Let's just, let's try this out for 30 days and then let's see how you do. If you do get 15, you can make $3,000 on top of whatever you're getting on top. If you do that consistently, you can make $150,000. So how does that sound? And okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. You I can see. Maybe look at some sort of like profit sharing at the end of the year or something like that. I, I'm pretty sure you, you can do that, right? Mm, not from the get-go. If he's that good and it's that integral, maybe six months in, 12 months in, sure. But not from the get-go. Yeah, man, you have, you have no idea how he is. So just start off with something. This is a 60 day plan. That's how we do it from that. But if you have a 60 day plan, then we could uh, see what we can do. For now, this is also for you. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and he's going to be, he he wants to do the intake, the, the sales, everything, which is an amazing idea. But yeah, I have to figure out the, the pay part. That's that's definitely where we want to be, Rosanna. I know it's not where you're used to and don't let me to lose, but 
again, when we're we'll doing this for the next 10, 20 years, you can be integral part of this whole process. Not only is it your conversion rates drop off every step that you have, you know, just imagine it becomes half, half, half. So by the time you get to the end, it's like you have a 25% chance as you would have had it on the doing in one shot. So have that in mind. And then second is your time, your sanity. You could do it for five years, 10 years, but until when? So let's just get you out of that. And yes, there are people that are even again, don't put your things into this one guy. There's other people that, that are capable, even without any criminal defense experience, that can do it for you. So yeah, just shoot for it. And yeah, let's find it. No. And, yeah. Suggestion to the, the intake to be that person who also closes the the who who closes the who sells the retainer or your suggestion is those to be two different people. Ideally, one person. One person. Ideally. Okay. Yeah, one person who qualifies. Great. This is exactly what we do. If in fact in the last uh, this year we've done about thirty of these cases. And we can't make any promises, but we usually have good results. And starts off our thing starts off at this. Uh, different questions for me. Honestly, it's not as bad as it seems. It's especially if it's a very straightforward person who has confidence. You just put it out there. Marty says, can you bonus on profit or above a certain revenue point? I would not get into that world. I've seen some people do that. It creates a lot of issues, expectations, issues, greed. Is You don't have to. You shouldn't probably. So no. William says, if things go south and he gets mad at you, then you can report him, please. Yes. Yeah. Somebody who's kind of that forward is going to be like that too. And William says, don't do it. Jimmy says, fire him. I don't know who that's for. Yeah. And then Winnie gave us some ethical stuff. Yeah. Depends on the state too. Ellen, did you get your scoring system? Uh, let's go over it. I'm looking at it right now. The scoring system that anyone uses is number one. And anyone feel free to uh, talk this out with me. Number one is tone and sympathy. Are they sympathetic with the potential client? Have to build report zero to one to five scoring system based on that. Number two is the knowledge of the law or whatever. The ability to explain all aspects of our lemon law in a convincing authoritative way. Great. Third is CRM slash data collection. A five is all fields that are filled out appropriately. A two is just one is 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 just one field being missing is a two, Iman? Yeah, like a score of a two is a field is missed and one to zero are multiple fields missed, wrong info inputted. Like a three or a four is like they got everything, but maybe they did something incorrectly. That's like a very, depending on how sophisticated your CRM is, it's it's easy to tell if somebody's screwing that, that piece up. Nice. And it should be difficult. They have to be perfect to get a five. Love it. Cutthroat. Judgment and number four, judgment, accurately identifying which uh, path the client needs to take. A five is maximizing the potential outcome for the client. If not a sign up, they're growing the case. Worst six is a bad lead. The one is a completely misidentifying the path. Very good. And number five is persuasion. Are they able to get the potential client to do what they want? Five is the client is that the client takes action on the call. A three is the client claims that they will take action. And one is the client refuses or deflects. This was shared in the chat. If anybody wants it, feel free to download it. These are kind of what to look for. Iman doesn't do this himself. We just delegate this out to one or two people. Iman, who do this on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, so ideally you want to train whoever's going to do this on this and you want to calibrate with them on some sort of a cadence. So when I implemented this, I met... I meet with the supervisors that are doing it on like a daily basis to start for an hour. And then I, I help them score calls or, and, and now they bring me calls where they're on the fence about a couple things. So I make sure that they're always calibrated on how I would score a call. Um, so I know that they're scoring calls correctly. So I, you do need to make sure you're calibrating with whoever's going to do this, but yeah, we have, we have a full-time person who's listening to calls and then supervisors are also listening to calls. So eventually we'll have four or five people listening to calls on a daily basis. My last question is what's your recommendation in building a conversation AI for intakers? I know you said they just rebumped this thing. So I was feeding into a document, a lot of information. I wanted to convert it, transform that into a place where my intakers could go there and get question answers. But is that a recommendation? Is that even small? Is that, is that something you still recommend doing? One, like yeah, 1 million percent. Why not? You could just use ChatGPT for it. With the new update to the ChatGPT GPT thingy that they just released, it could be built into that, which not only is it 
text, but you could also upload a bunch of documents and files in there, which again, I'm going to go through these motions this weekend and I'll share my experience with you. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just a resource. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, save the data. And that's the reason also I moved to Evernote. I think I mentioned this a while ago, six months ago. I moved everything to Evernote, right? You want to consolidate all your data into one place because the next couple of years, all these AI tools are going to be released, but you need your own personal data to be able to train it and feed it. So imagine everything about everything about everything is in my Evernote. And then as soon as Evernote releases their completely AI thing, AI conversation chat, I could now ask my own custom built knowledge base about everything. Yeah. Can I say what you will all my work notes, all my work notes about how to make UGCs, how to do anything, all the different tools. Yeah, a lot of times I go consolidate all these notes that I've saved over the years that are in Evernote, and then I go take that and create a Google Docs for you guys. So you, know, you guys see the finished, polished, actionable version of it, of what's been stored and saved for many, many years. Yeah. Yes, second brain. Yeah, I didn't realize it. It's like I was doing this and then all of a sudden I started reading the book. I'm like, oh wait, this is exactly what it is. Yeah, there's a book called Second Brain that explains this. But yeah, get your data, get your data. Iman, actually let's, let's do, this is like one hour in. Now we could talk about some off topic stuff. There was also something you brought up when you joined and I'm, and I'm like, yes, I'm using AI, using your documents to train AI to, yeah, you want to just talk that out so that people can know what is possible and start thinking about this. So one thing I was working on at my previous firm and something that we're going to do, Sam and I are going to do is actually using AI to read what a perfect case looks like and score a case essentially. So for Lemon Law, we use repair orders and work orders as our primary evidence. Those are essentially receipts, cars you get from a dealership when you drop your car off. So training an AI on what a great case looks like and scoring a case based off of its strength, essentially, is something that we plan on doing in the future. And also just using it, say you need to compile your evidence into one document. If AI can OCR and read it and then put it all into one document so you can review it, uh, that's going to be a big time saver as well. And then you have the added benefit of down the road, an intake agent you know, taking those documents, putting it into the machine and saying, oh, this is a great case. Let me sign it up. But with, with that, you need to have a robust CRM. You need to have the historical data and then you need to, then you need to anticipate some time training training the model on that data it's these all these AI tools are making it easy and easy as long as you have the pdfs and the microsoft word files that's all it needs that plus some instructions so collect your data all the different things clients yeah especially for these obscure niches uh, the criminal defense or the ones that are kind of hard to qualify you, you, when you give it all these the facts of the case of your last 100 clients will be able to decipher whether this new potential client could also be a case and if so what is the expected outcome and expected result and expected settlement you get out of this and how quickly you can settle it and all that stuff. This is all huge. And then once that's fully integrated into your CRM, then it will essentially replace a lot of legal work as well. It's start drafting stuff.